Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Thank you for um, allowing me to come and do this. Um, I actually, um, by the way, I'm Kelly. Um, I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Hi. <laughs> um, I actually wrote on my fourth step that I was afraid of public speaking in the hopes that my sponsor would take pity on me so I wouldn't have to come and do things like this. Um, but she didn't care. So <laughs> here I am. I get to do this, and I'm super happy about it. Um, it does always make me a little bit nervous, but I just have to remember that we're all just a bunch of drunks, and, and uh, we all understand each other. So... Um, so, yes, I'm Kelly. Um, my home group is the primary purpose group. I didn't know um, what AA was uh, before I got into the program. I didn't really even know what an alcoholic was before I got into the program. Um, I just knew that I didn't drink right. Um, so I thought that's what an alcoholic was. I had no idea that um, I'm bodily and, and mentally different than than people like my sister, who's able to just open up a bottle of wine, pour herself a glass, and then put the bottle back in the refrigerator and forget about it. Uh, but for me, I don't even know what types of wine are supposed to be refrigerated after I open them um, because I, they never get that far. Um, so, um, but I didn't know, I didn't know what was so different between me and my sister to where she could do that and I couldn't. And it was so frustrating for me for so long. I mean, it was depressing for me for so long um, and scary um, because I just didn't understand. Um, I remember one of the questions that I asked, um, I went to treatment here in Dallas. One of the questions that I asked um, my counselor was, why do I keep trying to destroy myself? Because I couldn't figure it out. I thought I was you know, doing it to myself. I thought there was just something inherently wrong with me. Um, but I have a disease, um, which is alcoholism. Um, and uh, that was a, a relief for me to learn that, actually, that um, it's not uh, my fault, um, it's just, you know, it's my body is different and my mind is different and that's it, you know? Um, I don't have to, uh, you know, carry the burden of trying to fix myself anymore um, because I can't fix myself. Um, so, but I grew up, um, I haven't always lived here. I grew up in California, so um, I'm, I'm one of the people that you can blame for the housing prices going, <laughs> going up. Um, but, um, but I grew up in California. My family, um, they're all very... Uh, uh, very religious. Um, there was no drinking in our household, um, and I didn't start drinking until I was 14, which is young, I know, but um, a lot of us start drinking at that time. Um, for me, looking back on my drinking, I can see the physical component of alcoholism. I can see that um, from when I took my very first drink. Um, I was 14, uh, and I uh, was at a friend's house, and we had uh, Everclear and Kool-Aid, because I'm classy, and um, I took my first drink and immediately it was just like, this is it. This is, this is what's going to solve my problems. Um, I had really bad social anxiety, um, and I still do, but I did then too. Um, and alcohol for me solved that problem. Um, and alcohol solved a lot of problems for me um, when I was younger, um, before it started causing more problems than it solved. Um, but when I took that first drink, immediately... Um, it set off, you know, what the book calls is the, the craving for alcohol. It set off my allergy, which caused a, a craving beyond my mental control. Um, so I took that first drink, and then I just remember grabbing the bottle um, of liquor and then just chugging from the bottle of liquor because I just could not overcome. I know you're making that face. It, it was that bad. <laughs> um, but I just could not. I needed more. It was like a physical purely a physical reaction. Um, I needed more. And um, that was essentially what drinking was like for me from then on. Um, when I took a drink, I needed more, regardless of whether or not I wanted more. Um, but because I was young, uh, I, you know, I didn't have a car payment. I didn't have rent. Um, I didn't really even have, I didn't have romantic relationships, you know, that were affected by how I drank. And so I didn't really have any consequences as a result of my drinking. Um, so I didn't see a problem with the way that I drank when I did drink. Um, it also looked to me like everybody that I drank with um, drank like me. Um, because, you know, when you're young, you don't get alcohol very often. And so when you get it, you're going to get drunk, right? Um, at least that's how I felt. I don't know if anybody else felt that way that I was drinking with. Um, but we all got drunk, you know, and so I didn't see a problem with the way that I was drinking. And I didn't see a problem with the way that I was drinking for a really long time. Um, 
I would experience consequences infrequently, like um, being grounded from like AOL Instant Messenger, which was like the end of the world for me. Um, but it was small things like that, you know? I didn't lose anything um, because, you know, I was so young. Um, but, uh, you know, and at, at, at that time, I wasn't able to drink very frequently anyway. Um, but when I did drink, it was a lot. Um, and I did not, I was not able to see, um, I was not able to see, like, I didn't know about, I mean, I was young. I didn't know about the allergy to alcohol. Um, I didn't know that my body processed alcohol differently um, than other people. Um, and so, um, you know, I drank when I was younger because I felt like it solved my problems with anxiety. Um, but, you know, as I continued drinking and as I got older, um, I started to get in a little bit of trouble as a result of my drinking. And so that whole, you know, this helps my anxiety, um, like excuse wasn't really cutting it anymore. So I actually started to make up reasons as to why I drank. Um, I lied about um, some really big, um, I made some really big accusations at people um, and used that as the reason as to why I drank. Because for me, I couldn't really even figure out why I got so drunk when I drank. And I couldn't really figure out why I just wanted to drink all the time, right? Um, and so I felt like I needed a better excuse. And so I made that excuse up. Um, because in my mind, I thought, you know, if people believed that this thing happened to me, um, they would think, oh, yeah, you know, I'd drink if I were her too, you know? I thought, you know, if you were in my shoes, you would drink like I did, you know? And so um, I... You know, I actually used that excuse so often that I started to believe it. Um, I became, you know, like delusional. Um, and so, um, but eventually, like, don't worry, I got some, I experienced some consequences, so then I really did have something to drink about, right? Um, so um, I actually, um, when I was uh, in my early 20s, um, I got married to somebody that I had been dating for about two months. Um, and um, I liked him because he drank like me. Um, I don't know, the cool thing about, about AA is that nobody can, um, nobody can tell you whether or not you're an alcoholic. This is something that you have to diagnose yourself. So I can't say that, that my ex-husband um, was an alcoholic. Um, only he can do that, but I do know that he certainly drank a lot like me, um, which was good for me, you know, because I felt like, um, you know, I had, uh, somebody who understood uh, the draw of, of alcohol. Um, we would drink together, we, it was good company. Um, and so um, we were married for about um, like seven and a half years. Um, and during the course of that seven and a half years, both of our drinking progressed so much that the relationship just became very, very toxic, right? Um, yeah, he was abusive to me, I was abusive to him, and because of that abuse, that then became my reason for drinking. So it was no longer my anxiety. Well, it was still, like, of course, I still use that. Um, it was no longer the assault. Now I had something, like, tangible right in front of me that I could say, you would drink like me if you were married to this guy. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people agreed with me um, for a time, right? Um, so alcohol is a progressive illness, um, and like looking back in my life, I can definitely see how it progressed in my life um, to the point where I needed more and more and more in order to get the job done. Um, but at the same time, I, um, my consequences progressed. So one thing that I like to say is that um, our consequences don't make us alcoholics. Um, a lot of people like will focus on the consequences like oh I got to you know well I focused on the consequences right like I don't have a DWI so I'm not an alcoholic or um, I haven't lost my house so I'm not an alcoholic things like that um, our consequences are not what defines us as alcoholics it's what my body does when I put alcohol into it and it's the fact that my mind convinces me that my body does not have that reaction right um, but of course you know with alcohol eventually we start to experience some consequences. Um, 
whether those are external consequences, so like DWIs and things like that, or internal consequences, which I feel like everybody suffers from, like the shame of, of getting drunk when you didn't mean to, or um, the depression that hits when you're withdrawing, or the anxiety, which is funny to me because I drank at first in order to um, relieve that anxiety, but then alcohol ended up causing a lot of anxiety, so it's kind of like, Joke's on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but I experienced a lot of those internal consequences. And then as my drinking progressed, I started experiencing those external consequences. Um, but, you know, because I was married to this guy who drank a lot like me, even though it was a toxic marriage, um, I, I was comfortable with where I was at, right? I knew alcohol, right? The book says that our alcoholic life becomes the only normal one, and that's definitely, I can definitely see that in my life. To where it is so uncomfortable, but it's familiar, and I don't see another way to live, right? Um, so, um, you know, we were, we were married for a while, for a little bit too long, like seven years too long. And <laughs> um, we eventually ended up getting divorced. Um, I know that my alcoholism played a part in that. Um, it wasn't everything. That wasn't like the whole reason as to why we got divorced, but we, I did end up getting divorced. And so I thought, um, at this point in my life, like so for a while, um, I didn't really see a reason to stop drinking, right? Um, because, you know, my, my husband drank like me. Um, and um, even though things were starting to get rough in my life because of my alcoholism, um, which I didn't know was alcoholism at that point, um, I, was, I convinced myself that the things I was experiencing were the result of other things, so like health problems. So like I would consistently, sorry everybody, but I would consistently wet the bed, right? And so for me, I was convinced it is not my alcoholism, I just have a health issue, right? It's just a health issue. Um, or uh, I'd get the shakes, right? And I'd think, mm, it's not how much I drank last night, it's because I have just low blood sugar, which, I mean, low blood sugar is true, right? But it was the alcohol that caused it. Um, but I would constantly convince myself that the problems I was having in my life were not directly a result of what I was drinking. It was just because, um, like, I'm a victim, right? I, I'm a victim of, of my health problems and of my husband and of my low blood sugar. Um, but yeah, so I didn't see a reason to, um, to try and control my drinking. Um, I really didn't. Um, and it wasn't really until the end of my marriage and after we got divorced when I, I realized like, hmm, you know, <laughs> this way of life might not actually be very sustainable. Maybe I should try and start to control my drinking. So I did, I tried, I tried really hard. I um, tried some different religions. Um, I, you know, I grew up with uh, a very religious uh, family um, and that particular religion uh, didn't work for my alcoholism. So um, let me try this other religion. Maybe this other religion will help. Well, that didn't help. So maybe, maybe I need to try, um, for a while my ex-husband and I tried to keep chickens because we thought that if we had these little things we were you know, in charge of and we had to like clean out their coop and stuff that would keep us so busy we wouldn't have time to drink. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> It is really hard to clean out a chicken coop when you are fall down drunk. Really hard. It's gross too. Just um, so we tried that. We tried to keep chickens. Um, I tried um, self help books. My sister even sent me some books. Um, what else did I try? I mean, exercise, um, exercise and yoga. So I tried. I tried a whole bunch of different things. Um, I even tried therapy. Uh, but I lied to my therapist a lot. Um, you know, how much are you drinking? Oh, I'm not drinking at all. And I'm like drunk while I'm seeing her. So um, none of those things were working for me, right? Um, but I was trying. Like all of a sudden now, like I'm trying to control my drinking. Um, then I think to myself, well, if I can't control it, maybe I should just stop, right? What a novel idea, just stop drinking, right? Um, so I tried. I tried to just stop drinking. But there was always something that led me back to taking a drink, whether it was a big thing, like all of a sudden getting divorced, 
or a little thing like this tree looked at me wrong or it's Tuesday or <laughs> something like that. You know, they got my Starbucks order wrong or something. Like there was always something that would lead me back to taking that first drink. Um, and that was frustrating for me, right? Because I knew what happens when I drink, right? You know, I, I, I drink, I get drunk, and then I do things um, that I'm not proud of. Um, I do dangerous things. I make people angry with me. I do illegal things. Uh, I drunk call my boss. Like, there's the, the consequences. Like, I remembered. that. That's the frustrating thing, too, right? I didn't forget what happened, right? Um, I didn't forget all of those things that I did when I was drunk. Um, I didn't forget the consequence. Sometimes I'd forget the things that I did when I was drunk because I'd black out. Sorry. But um, I, I, I would remember that feeling of waking up the next day and being so full of regret, right? Or feeling so sick, you know, and swearing it off. I am never, ever going to touch a drop again, right? Um, I have a friend who says you could hook me up to a lie detector test and it would show that I'm telling the truth, right? Because at the end of my drinking, I was so serious about stopping when I stopped, I, it would have shown that I was telling the truth, right? Because at that point, it was, it was starting to become life or death, right? Um, I was starting to fear falling asleep because I didn't know if I was going to wake up. Um, and so... Every time I swore off alcohol, I meant it. Um, I truly did not ever want to drink again. But at some point, I would wind up with a bottle in my hand, right? Um, and I'd make that, you know, I'd make those excuses. I'd make those excuses, you know, um, I had a bad day or um, I, I deserve it. Like, how many people have uh, treated themselves to alcohol because they've gone through a period of sobriety? I did. <laughs> Why not? You know, I did real well. I must not be an alcoholic. Let me go buy myself a beer, right? That's what actually ended up happening in my last spree. Um, so uh, there was, uh, after I got divorced, I actually ended up moving into my family's house. I lived, so in California, um, they had this house on a ranch and it had a basement. Um, which is like very dangerous I feel like in California because of like wildfires like how you can escape that um, but like I was living in their basement um, and uh, it was my sister her husband she had four kids at the time now she has six um, she's crazy um, and then my parents uh, live in that house as well um, so I was living in their basement and I thought that they didn't know that I was drinking because I was down in the basement, but they definitely knew. Um, and there was one day where one night, I don't, it was a day, something, um, I was drinking and I was drunk, um, and I was, uh, passed out downstairs on the couch and, um, just completely blacked out and my nephews walked downstairs two of my nephews walked downstairs um and found me and they didn't know whether or not i was alive or dead like it scared them because i wouldn't wake up when they tried to wake you know aunt kelly up you know um so they ran and they told my brother-in-law um who came and checked to make sure i was alive and i was and um i didn't know any of this because i was passed out um but you know, the following day, he approached me and he told me, uh, you need to stop. Like, you need to stop drinking. You need to go to AA. You need to go to a treatment center. You need to go to therapy. You need to do something, but you cannot live here and drink. And so I did not know. I had my whole adult life I was married. Um, and so I did not know how to live by myself as an adult. And so uh, I was like, no, <laughs> I need to get sober then. This is it. This is the last, this is my last chance, right? So I went to AA. I decided to go to AA. So I went to two meetings, right? Um, and I was like, this is weird. Um, and after, I think it was like two weeks. So I went once one week and then once the next week. Um, after that second meeting, I thought to myself, I haven't drank in two weeks. I must not be an alcoholic. I'm good. I'm good. So I went home 
after that second AA meeting, went to CVS and I bought some um, liquor because you can buy liquor uh, at CVS in California. And um, so I went, I bought some liquor and because I deserved it, right? I did a really good job at being sober. Like what a good aunt I am, right? I, I took my brother-in-law's suggestion um, and everything's good now. Um, so that started my last spree, which lasted um, like six months. Um, and it was exhausting. Um, you know, I thought getting into this program that running around to a whole bunch of different AA meetings and like being of service to others was going to be exhausting. There is nothing that compares to the exhaustion that I felt of continuing that cycle. It is exhausting, right? By the time I got into treatment, I was so tired. I was so tired. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, my, my last spree started and, uh, for some reason my family let me move with them from California to Texas. Uh, I think that they were afraid of what would happen if they left me in California. Um, rightfully so, <laughs> because I don't know what I would have done. Um, and so I'm grateful that they let me move with them. So I moved, uh, out, we went to, does anyone know where Maybank is? Yeah, we moved to Maybank, way different from where I'm from. Um, and I moved into, it's like an hour southeast. It's a little like cow town, like a, there's like a bunch of tractors. And, <laughs> um, and so I moved into a trailer on their property. Um, I felt like, I felt super ritzy, but looking back, I'm like the stereotypical like drunk aunt living in a trailer on the property. <laughs> I was like, "Ooh, look at my trailer!" Um, but I moved, <laughs> I moved into this trailer, and it was perfect because I could get as drunk as I wanted. I could lock the doors, and no one would bother me. I wouldn't have to worry about anyone finding me. It was, it was the perfect place for me, right? Um, and so I. I carried on like that in that trailer for, for months. Um, and the only frustrating thing is that sometimes, like, you can't buy alcohol here. Like, it's like on Sundays or something. I don't remember. Um, but the frustrating thing is, like, on those days where I wasn't able to buy alcohol, I would try and buy extra, right, to tide me over, and it wouldn't last. No, no matter what I did, right? It would not last. Um, so, but I carried on like that for a while um, in the trailer. And um, like at this point, so for a while, like I tried to stop. I tried to moderate. I tried, right? Um, but at this point, it was like, this is it. Like this is, I'm destined to die a drunk. Um, I don't know. It started, okay, so... Alcohol um, was fun at first for, for a while, right? It was fun. Um, then it started becoming more like a chore. Like I felt like I had to drink. And then at one point, it turned into I don't know how to live without alcohol. Uh, and then by the time I moved to Texas, it was I don't know how to live with it either. Um, so I just did not know. I was like between a rock and a hard place, right? I didn't know how to live without it. I didn't know how to live with it. Um, and so it was like, it, it was just like I was just existing. Um, I was not living for anything. Um, it was like I was between life and death, like constantly. It was a very scary place to be. Um, I had no hope. In fact, here's here's what I did. So when moving moving to Texas, I was so um, like over life that I started looking into going to a, a mortuary science school because I'm like, well, I'm close to death, might as well try this. So I signed up uh, to receive emails from this mortuary science school and I still get emails from them. But I was like, so I knew like I had more in common, I felt like with dead people than I did with, with uh, people who were alive. Um, because of my alcoholism, right? Um, but at this point, I still didn't know what alcoholism was. Um, so uh, there was one night um, when uh, I was supposed to be going on a date, um, which, like, who? oh, man, that poor guy. Um, 
but I was supposed to be going on a date, uh, and I thought, uh, well, I'm really nervous, um, so why not, you know, kind of like loosen up with some wine, right? But we know I have the allergy, right? So I thought I was just going to have one glass of wine. One glass of wine turned into two glasses, turned into four glasses, turned into, oh, got to find some beer in the fridge, um, to the point where I was drunk, right? I was drunk, but I still had to go meet this guy. I didn't want to let him down. Um, so I got in my car. This is the first time that I had ever gotten into my car while like drinking, right? Like I had drunk drove before, like with a hangover, but I had never in the same night of drinking gotten into my car and driven. Um, but I did that night. Um, there's a first time for everything. And so um, got into my car, started driving to meet this guy. And on my way there, it was like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing with my life? Um, all of a sudden, like this, the thought of continuing on as I had been was so just um, depressing to me that I just couldn't, I like, I could not physically bear it. Um, you know, I was going, I was going to meet some guy I didn't know at a bar. I was drunk. I lived in a trailer. Um, you know, my family didn't want to talk to me. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so at that like very moment, I just purposely just, um, drove my car off the side of the road in the hopes that it would kill me. Um, <laughs> thankfully it didn't. Um, because I was too drunk to do a good job. But um, I drove off the side of the road, um, crashed my car, it totaled my car. Um, and that was the night where like all of the consequences that I could possibly, that I felt like I could possibly have as a result of my drinking happened just all in the same night. Um, so, you know, I got my first um, uh, charge. Um, I, uh, you know, totaled my car. I had to spend um, the night in jail. Um, my family didn't want to talk to me anymore. Um, so when my family came and picked me up from jail, thankfully they were still wanting to do that. Um, they came and picked me up from jail. I just told my dad, I just don't want to live anymore. If you, if I have to go back into my trailer, I'm not coming out. Like it's not going to happen. Um, so thankfully they put me away. Um, they, um, took me to the hospital where um, I was taken to a behavioral health hospital where I spent the next 10 days. And while I was there, I thought, all right, I'm never drinking again. It is never happening. Never drinking again, right? I got out and my family told me, you're not allowed to come back home. You can't live with us anymore. And my first thought after getting a DWI, after spending the night in jail, after having to spend 10 days in the loony bin was, I need a drink. I need a drink. I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. Um, thankfully my mom threw away all of my alcohol. What a sweetheart. And, um, they, uh, they told me, you know, you can't live here anymore. So, um, I thought, well, maybe I can live at treatment for a little bit, right? So I found a 30 day treatment center here in Dallas. Um, and, uh, it's an all women's treatment center. Um, I'm very grateful for that place. Um, so, you know, I went to treatment because I thought maybe I'll be able to learn how to drink right, <laughs> right, at treatment. They do not have how to drink right courses there. Um, they do not even have how to stop drinking courses there. It is just a treatment center. Um, so, um, you know, while I was there, uh, they have people coming in and, and um, giving, uh, we, at PPG we call them foundation meetings. I don't know what y'all call them here, but where they go over steps one, two, and three. Because at that point, I still didn't know what an alcoholic was, right? I knew I probably was one, but I didn't know like why, um, or like how, or anything like that. So this lady comes in and she like, looks like she's just happy to be alive. Like she comes in, you know, she's got some sobriety. She's got like her roots done. She <laughs> smells good. At that point in time, I did not. Um, and so she comes in and she's talking to me about, she is describing me, right? She's describing what happens when I drink. She's describing me when I'm trying to not drink, right? And how that always fails. Um, and then she says the thing, so this is the thing that was the most confusing to me that I thought maybe she's like, maybe she's kind of like full of it was she does not think about drinking anymore. That was like, hmm, I had not heard that before. 
Like, because when I went to the other AA meetings, they were all talking about how much life uh, stinks, but at least I didn't drink today. Like, that's what I heard. And so that's what I thought sobriety was going to be like, was, you know, life sucks, but I'm just going to keep trying to not drink. Sorry. I don't, I feel weird saying, like, sucks in a church. So I don't know. <laughs> um, but, um, sorry to the Lord. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to not cuss. Um, but... Um, like, I thought I was going to have to try to not drink, right? I thought I thought I was going to have to struggle. And so that's why this did not seem appealing to me, because I thought, I have to read this and do what's in this and try and not drink. I would just rather just try to not drink, right? I don't want to do any extra stuff. But when she told me she didn't think about drinking, she didn't have to try to not drink, like, that was what kind of gave me a little bit of hope. I didn't know, like, I didn't, I was very skeptical, right? Um, and I did not want to do all the stuff in here, right? It even says in the book, um, what is it? It says basically, like, uh, we didn't want to, I don't know, we didn't want to do it. I can't remember. Um, hold on. I want to find it. So it says... Never mind, I can't find it. I've been sober for three years, but I still can't find anything in the book. Um, <laughs> it, it's, is it in how it works? How they're like not excited about doing it, but they, they, they had no other choice, essentially. I'm paraphrasing, right? Um, I was not excited about doing this stuff, but at that point in my life, I, um, I had no other alternative, right? Because I felt like I had tried everything. Or if I hadn't tried everything, I knew that I had tried enough to where me trying to do something wasn't going wasn't gonna to cut it, right? But this lady, you know, standing in front of me who's sober, she's happy about it, and she doesn't have to try to not drink, like, um, she, what she did worked for her, right? She's the first person I had met or had listened to, right? Um, because I had probably met some other recovered alcoholics. I just wasn't ready to listen to them yet. But she's the first person that I met who, you know, who one, explained what an alcoholic was, right? And then two, like, told me about, like, that there's a solution, right? Um, and so I was like, man, if it worked for her, it probably maybe going to work for me. Like, maybe it'll work for me. I hope it works for me, right? And so that's how I started the program. Um, that's even kind of like what my higher power was, right? Like I did my step one. I realized that there's nothing that I can do that is going to save me from an alcoholic death. I'm going to die. When I, when I get out of treatment, I'm going to drink, right? That's, when I, that's my step one. There's nothing I can do. Um, but my step two for me um, was essentially just being willing to – to believe, being willing, having hope that what worked for my sponsor could work for me too. I did not have a higher power that I like, I didn't have a definable higher power. I didn't know what my higher power looked like. Um, I didn't really even, like I had a problem with God, but it really wasn't that big of a deal because I'm like, I'm dying. Like I need to like do the, what my sponsor did, right? And then I can figure out all this higher power stuff later. Right. But for right now, like I need to be alive in order to figure out who God is. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, I decided to go through the work. I still don't really know who God is, but <laughs> maybe someday <laughs> I'll figure it out. Um, so that was my step two. And essentially what my what that was, was um, I think my sponsor just asked me, uh, so you believe in God. Right. And I was like, oh, maybe. And she was like, all right. Cool. So then we moved on to step three, which was made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So I didn't understand God, but I had the hope that there was something out there that could save me. And that was all that I needed. Right. Isn't that cool? That that's all that I needed. Um, I thought I had to would have to have it all figured out, but I didn't, um, which is really, really great. Because at that point in my sobriety, I there was my brain was mush. Um, 
So made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. So I thought that this was like um, when I did this and like I prayed the third step prayer, like the angels would descend from the heavens and the clouds would part and like there would be a chorus of people singing hallelujah. Um, that is not what happened. We were, um, we got on our knees and prayed this prayer um, in like a, a spirit. Uh, side room in my treatment center and essentially what this was was like um, I, I I made a decision just to do the rest of the work right because I don't know how to turn my will and my life over to the care of God like I don't know how to do that I didn't know how to do that right I'm just making a decision to do it right um, there's not really any action in this step um, and so um, I didn't fully understand that. I didn't understand a lot of this when I first started going through the work, right? My sponsor made me read the book, but I didn't, you know, I kind of learned, you know, as, as we went through it. Um, but um, like, I was just kind of like so desperate. I was kind of like, all right, come on, let's go, let's do this. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I learned how to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I do the steps. Um, that's not something I get from step three, because if it was, then it would just be a three-step program. Um, and I need the rest of the steps, right? Even step 12, which I didn't want to do, but I'm doing. Um, and I love doing now. Um, so um, we did step three uh, in the treatment center. Um, and immediately, she, uh, my sponsor handed me these worksheets, which is basically just like a helpful guide for, for me to better understand how to do step four. Um, and so um, I, the first time, so when I wrote my inventory, which is what step four is, um, I um, wasn't 100% truthful about uh, mine and my ex-husband's relationship. I did not know how to articulate the type of abuse that I experienced, um, and so I didn't include it on my, on my, I included him on my fourth step, but my reason for it was um, not truthful. Um, and so um, I, that ended up coming to bite me um, later in sobriety, and thankfully I did not uh, drink over it, but I very well could have. Um, and so I'm really grateful for this program and that like, it helps me to become aware of my thoughts and my actions so that I didn't have to get to that point of taking a drink before I was able to get honest about what happened. Um, and, um, so what time is it? I have 15 minutes left? Okay, okay, cool, thank you. Um, so, um, so I did step four um, and I didn't 100% like under so at first I had like three people on my inventory um, and because I thought oh I don't hold grudges like that was literally what I told my sponsor and she told me that is not true um, go read this chapter again pray and ask God to show you what you need to see and then come back to me when you're ready when you have more people on your list because I was definitely uh, angry at a lot more people um, so I did that we ended up meeting for our fifth step and um, I did not have a bunch of I didn't have what I thought I didn't have the relief I thought I was gonna get and I didn't understand that at first right but what I came to understand is it's because I wasn't hundred percent honest with my sponsor in my fifth step and I ended up having relief from that later when I was able to get honest with her and it wasn't it was about a year later when I was finally when I finally was uh, honest with my sponsor about that um, so um, I always recommend um, to be as honest as possible in your fifth step uh, to uh, it, it was very uncomfortable it was a very uncomfortable year for me um, full of resentment and full of fear, um, all because I was not honest in my fifth step. Uh, very, uh, could have been very easily avoided. Um, so, I did my uh, fifth step with my um, sponsor and uh, immediately went home and was um, uh, quiet for an hour. Um, the book says to take an hour and so my sponsor and I go through the book very um, like literally so I went home and I was quiet for an hour and I prayed for an hour um, and um, you know then I was able to move on with uh, step six uh, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character and then I asked him to remove them uh, in step seven 
And then in step eight, I made the list, which I had because I did my fourth step and my fifth step. So I had the list of people that I had harmed. And because I'm from California, I actually had not, I was not able to make amends to a lot of people for a really long time. Um, and I actually just this past year went to um, California and was able to make uh, amends to a boss of mine that I had. Um, I came to work drunk a lot. Um, I thought she didn't know, but she did. And um, the cool thing is that in making amends to her, I learned that she was in Al-Anon for her uh, dad. So she definitely probably knew I was drunk at work. So, <laughs> um, but um, that was just a really cool experience in um, just being able to talk to her, talk with her a little bit about her experience with alcohol um, as a family member. Um, so, and then, you know, I made uh, amends to my sister, um, you know, and my brother-in-law because I was drunk at their house a lot. Uh, my sister, um, I thought, would never want to talk to me again. Um, but the cool thing is, is like, I have been able to go down and visit with my sister so much that um, her kids know my name. They didn't know my name before. I was never around. Um, and I was always really annoyed that they never knew my name and I had no idea it was because I was never there, right? So being able to be there for my nephews um, as a sober person and present as an aunt um, has been a really uh, amazing gift for me because they know my name and they look forward to having me come down and visit them. Um, I never thought um, I would be that kind of aunt. Um, and then I do steps 10, 11, and 12 um, every day. Um, when I first started, so step 10 um, is, uh, you know, uh, being aware of my, my thoughts and my actions. Um, you know, if I have a resentment or a fear, or if anything crops up, usually if it's like an uncomfortable feeling, um, I uh, pray about it. Um, I call my sponsor or I talk to somebody about it. I make amends if I need to, um, and then I go and help somebody. Um, so um, I uh, did not do well with that for a really long time, um, and it wasn't until the pandemic when I realized it's very important to do that, right? Um, so step 11 is um, sought through prayer and meditation to uh, maintain, uh, to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Um, so um, in the morning, I make a gratitude list, and I actually just started doing that recently. Um, I had never been good at step 11. Um, step 11 was really difficult for me for a really long time. Um, so now in the mornings, um, I do a gratitude list and that's just like my starting point, right? Like I'm, I'm making a gratitude list as my meditation and then I'm, I'm praying probably like the third step prayer. Um, uh, it's very difficult for me. Um, but the cool thing is that this is uh, progress and not perfection. Like I can always improve. Um, and so um, like I've realized the importance of improving on my step 11 because how can I, how can I 10th step, how can I be aware of my thoughts and my actions if I don't try to improve my conscious contact with God? And then how can I go and talk to other alcoholics if I um, don't practice step 11, right? Um, so then in step 12, um, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, which I thought the result of these steps was to just never drink again, but, um, you know, surprise, surprise, it's actually having a spiritual awakening. Um, uh, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all of our affairs. Um, so... Doing step 12 um, was a big fear of mine. In fact, when I um, was like a month and a half sober, I actually went back to the same treatment center that I got sober at. And um, my sponsor had me raise my hand um, to start sponsoring people, which I was like, girl, <laughs> uh, do you, are you sure? <laughs> like, are you? <laughs> I don't know if I know what I'm doing. The cool thing is, though, is that I know exactly, I know exactly what I'm doing because I've lived through it, right? And, and I don't have to guess about anything because it's all in here, right? I don't have to make anything up. Um, I don't have to, I don't have to guess. It's literally all written down in here, which for me was um, a big relief because I had been trying to do everything on my own for such a long time. Having everything spelled out for me and it being a, like a 
like a proven, it's proven, right? Because it worked for my sponsor, it worked for her sponsor, it worked for the people who wrote this book. Um, it, it's worked for, for so many other people, it's proven. So all I have to do is in here. So I've got this book, I've got my experience, I've got my knowledge, um, and that is enough, right? That is enough. And I can go and, you know, go and talk to other alcoholics, right? So I just one thing that I've been struggling with lately is um, I feel awkward, you know, like, um, and I've 10 stepped about it a lot with my sponsor. Like, I just feel like such an awkward person, just, you know, and it's like cognitively, I know that um, maybe I'm not awkward. I'm not 100% sold on the fact that I might not be awkward, um, but um, I am just very concerned about that. And so, um, one of the things that the book says is what is it like common sense or uncommon sense becomes common sense or common sense becomes uncommon sense. So common sense for me, like in my alcoholism, is if I feel awkward, I'm not going to talk to people. If I feel awkward, I'm going to go home. I'm going to stay home and think about how dumb I am. Right. That's common sense. Uncommon sense is when I feel that way, I go out and I talk to people. Right. And so that is that is direction like that I received from my higher power in meditation um, and I know that because it's not something I normally would think right um, talking to people used to scare me um, I I would you know I still break out in a cold sweat sometimes like right now but um, <laughs> but it was so bad I could barely communicate with other people and so you know now I know that um, all I have to do is is just go talk to it to drunk, you know, and that's the coolest thing. You know, if I'm feeling any type of way, um, if I go and I talk to another alcoholic, um, that will solve a lot of my problems. Right. There have been so many times where um, I, you know, have had financial insecurity or um, was really concerned about uh, my court date or um which I didn't end up having um, because my case got dropped. Um, but, or, you know, really concerned my dad had cancer. And um, I remember calling my sponsor in a panic, just being like, I, I just don't know what to do. And she, she said, you know, God will match uh, calamity with serenity, go talk to a drunk. And so my thought was, I wanna stay home and cry about how unfortunate this is for me that my dad has cancer, right? Um, so selfish, but, my sponsor told me, go talk to a drunk. And so that's what I did. And it was the best thing that she could have suggested I do. And it was the best thing that I did in that, that I could have done in that situation because it took me, my focus off of myself and onto other people. Um, I was expecting to just get sober and just to keep living my life, right? Um, I had no idea that like my sobriety would be a side effect of the, of, this of that spiritual awakening of the change in perspective having a different way to deal with life circumstances um sobriety is is wonderful um but that spiritual awakening that i have experienced as the result of the steps that is that makes life worth living right um i wake up every day and i know that um that God, like that God can use me and my really unfortunate um, experiences, the things that I did that I was so ashamed about, that can help somebody else. That is very, very cool. Because I was always afraid to tell people that I had peed the bed until I heard somebody else say it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, you too? That's awesome. Cool. Um, I will leave it at that. So <laughs> thank you.